I look at you and go, oh my God, this person needs to be moved into memory care immediately. Shauna sees you when you come in her building and goes, oh my gosh, you look worse than the person with the terminal brain disease. But because of compassion fatigue, you don't see it. If you stage your loved one today and your loved one is in stage five of the disease, they belong in memory care or a skilled facility because this is now a medical issue. And we know that as much as you don't want to do this, your loved one gets better care in memory care because they're surrounded by nurses. They're surrounded by licensed staff who are trained to look for things like delirium, urinary tract infections, seizures, and strokes. And these are all things that people with dementia deal with. When your loved one falls in a community, they have a whole team of people to pick them up. Plus, they have a nurse there to do a check on them to make a determination of whether they need to go to the ER. Some of you are home alone trying to pick up somebody who's twice your size. If your loved one falls and they're at home, call 911. The nice paramedics will come pick them up and do a range of motion. Okay? Don't hurt yourself trying to pick someone up. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. I feel so fancy, I have a slide person. Next slide. And remember, the person with dementia doesn't look ill. Every photograph you're gonna to see today is somebody with dementia. It's just that people with dementia, this is the disease where you don't look sick until you've lost an entire pound of brain tissue. And every time I say that, it amazes me. The human body does not look physically sick here until a pound of brain tissue is gone. And so it's not purposeful. And these are the words you need to take out of your vocabulary, faking it. You need to get that word out of your vocabulary. They're not faking it. They're responding to whatever their brain function is in this moment. They have agnosia. They're not aware that they do have dementia. I need to stay closer to the floor mic. This one right here, the big blue. <laughs> the Zoomers. The Zoomers can't hear me. What was I saying? <laughs> this is how it starts, right? Where were we? Where? Faking it. They're not faking it. They're not pretending. They're not acting like. They're not lying. They are simply responding to what is happening in their brain. Does that make sense to everybody? Thank you, lady in the front who said yes. If it wasn't for this lady, we'd still be on the first slide. <laughs> slide person. Okay. These are the nine most common forms of dementia. So out of those 128 dementias, some of those dementias strike only children. Some of those dementias, there's only one to 50 people in the entire world who have them. Some of those dementias are so rare, we vary. There, there's just not even, even, even research on it. These nine dementias are 98% of all the dementias. And these nine dementias help you determine questions to go back to your physician with. The way a medical diagnosis is made is the physician takes the person's age, sex, history, and then rules out everything it cannot be, and what you're left with is what it must be. Does that make sense to everybody? So I'm going to first use my mother on here, and then I'm going to do my father to give you an idea of how you use this tool to go back to your doctor with. My mother is 82 years old. She never played football, so we can mark off number nine, okay? My family doesn't have Huntington's. Huntington's is inherited in the family, and at 82, my mother is way too old. We don't have Huntington's in our family. I can take Huntington's off. My mother doesn't, um, has never had a drink of alcohol. How many of you can say that? <laughs> Aha, I'm going to have the pastor talk to y'all some more before we leave today. She's never had a drink of alcohol, and number seven is alcohol dementia, so we can take number seven off. My mother doesn't have Parkinson's disease, therefore she cannot have Parkinson's disease dementia, so we can take that one off. Frontal temporal dementia, the FTDs, those are dementias of people in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, or their 50s. We have some that have lived into their 70s, but primarily we think of this as dementia before the age of 60, and at 82, my mother is much too old for FTD. So we can take off number five. Lewy body dementia has some unusual behaviors. They are hallucinations that tend to be seen. There are four primary hallucinations. One is they see children. Two is they see bad people coming to get them. And that can include a family member and that would mean that family member can't visit. 
They see bugs, spiders, rats, and snakes crawling on them and bite, inviting them. And you and I are primitively hardwired not to like bugs, spiders, rats, or snakes. They see their spouse having sex with multiple people, having sex right in front of them, even though they can see them sitting here. One man I know sees his wife having sex in front of the HEB in their small town, and it horrifies him. As you can imagine, that hallucination causes some issues in the family. Okay. They also have sleep behavior disorder, REM behavior disorder. They kick and punch violently in the night to where they throw themselves out of bed or they hurt their spouse or partner. My mother doesn't have any of these features so we can rule out Louis body. But my mother is obese. My mother has high cholesterol, high blood pressure. She has AFib. She is screaming vascular things at us. So I'm gonna make a check next to vascular dementia. I wanna to talk to my doctor about that. Now, my mother's vascular condition has been a lifelong thing. We're born with that. You can be this big around and run marathons and have high cholesterol because you inherited it from your parents. Does that make sense? Okay. So it hasn't, she didn't suddenly develop these things overnight. And what we know about Alzheimer's is that if a person has any dementia and lives long enough, then Alzheimer's will creep in as well. So I'm going to go back to the doctor and I'm going to talk to the doctor about vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia for my mother. And if she has both of those, that is called a mixed dementia. Does that make sense to everybody? Let's do my father. My father did play football. He played six man football and won the state title as quarterback in 1954. Y'all know six man? People in New Jersey do not know six man. Okay, not a lot of tackling in six man because you were playing both sides of the field. So I'm not really worried about that, but I wanna make sure the doctor knows he did. My family doesn't have Huntington's, so I can take Huntington's off. You know, I told you mama didn't drink. Why do you think mama didn't drink? Daddy did enough for all of us, probably for everybody in here. Okay, so I definitely, even though he's been sober for 30 or 40 years, I definitely want to let the doctor know about number seven. Okay, because every time he took a drink, his brain couldn't use or produce thiamine, and that's what causes that damage, okay? My father doesn't have Parkinson's disease, therefore he doesn't have Parkinson's disease dementia, but two years ago, his brother suddenly developed Parkinson's. It became Parkinson's disease dementia very quickly. So I wanna make sure the doctor knows that my father's only sibling died two years ago of Parkinson's disease dementia. My father is too old for FTDs at 85, much too old. My father doesn't have any of the uh, hallucinations or REM sleep behavior disorder of uh, Louis body, so I can mark that one out. But as he had a cold beer in this hand, what did he have in this hand? What do you think a major cause of vascular dementia is? Cigarettes. So they told him in rehab, cigarettes, bad, bad. So he went to cigars. <laughs> then later on, they said cigars, bad, bad. So he went to chewing tobacco. He's doing his best to get his nicotine, all right? So I want to make sure the doctor is aware of the history of tobacco use and the history of actually smoking, okay? And at 85, my father is now in a group of people that one out of six have Alzheimer's dementia. So I want to make sure that we talk about those dementias. So do you understand how to use these nine dementias for your family members, okay? Do you understand how that you're not making a diagnosis but you're ruling out what it can't be, so you can go back with some better questions. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, slide person. Now remember, people with dementia don't look sick until stage six of the disease. And that's how they fool people. It's not intentional. It's a human belief that if you're really sick, you'd look sick. So I have had family members tell me that if the building, the, the memory care building their loved one was in would stop coddling them and make them get up and walk, then they would get up and walk. If they would make them use their brain, then they would recover. Well, that didn't happen at your house. And it's a brain disease that's killing brain cells. And that's what's causing the disease. Everybody needs to turn your phone off or my sister will call. She's trying to call right now. She does it at every conference. She's, she's very, and I can, I could answer the phone and I could say, Marianne, I'm in a conference right now. Yeah, I know. So then what happened was the guy drove up. Yeah, but right now I'm busy. I know it's a short story. So then, okay. 
They have good social skills in stage six. It's just they can't start the social skills. You and I have to start it. That's why when you walk into the community to visit your loved one, they all turn and look at you, but nobody says anything until you wave. And once you wave, the whole group will wave back at you. We have to start the social skill in stage six. They can no longer start. It. They're not aware of time. So if you need to go on a vacation, if you need to take a break, you need to talk to a community about respite care. Communities will take your loved one for two weeks to give you a chance to get your feet back underneath you or to go on a trip. You pack them up seven days worth of clothes, drop them off, and they'll take care of them while you're gone. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And then they're not aware of time and they're not aware of any odd behaviors that they're doing. So if you keep pointing out what they're doing wrong, you're going to get pushback from somebody who's annoyed with you. If they ask for the salt and you know they meant the sugar, give them the sugar. This is not a growing brain. This is not a teaching moment. This is a person with brain damage. One of the ways to help your family make a shift is start thinking of it as brain cancer. Start thinking of it as brain disease. We know for a fact that if a paramedic comes to your house and you say dementia, they will treat your person differently than if you say brain cancer. Because brain cancer, they go, oh my God, their brain doesn't work. If you say the word dementia, they think, well, they're faking it. They're pretending. They're acting like. Does that make sense to everybody? Has everybody seen that? Okay. Everybody with me so far? All right. This is all on the test later. That's why I want to make sure you're getting it. Yes, slide person. Now, the names of the dementia are giving you information. They're either named for a physician, so Alzheimer's, Lewy, Hicks, Parkinson, Huntington, Wernicke, Korsakoff, Crutzfeld, Jakob, Newman, Barr are all the names of doctors who discovered a dementia. Some dementias are telling you the area of the brain they're in. Frontal temporal dementias are in the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. This is where most of the damage is occurring. Some of the dementias are telling you what caused the disease. What is the cause of vascular dementia? Something vascular? what I'm thinking. And then some dementia's names are telling you what's going to happen. Primary progressive aphasia, the primary course of this dementia, it only gets worse is the inability to use and understand language. Okay, so the name of the dementia is giving you information. Slide two. Now this is Alice Alzheimer and the woman is Augusta D. Alice Alzheimer was on duty in a hospital in Germany in 1905 when Augusta Dieter's family brought her in. She was 54 years old. This is the only known picture taken of her. And when Dr. Alzheimer did her intake, they actually found his notes about 12 years ago on the intake of her. He took it in four different languages, which is what I usually do. <laughs> I whip out the old Latin, use that for a little bit, some German, some German dialect. You know, I like to spread it around. And his notes look just like something your doctor would have written today. Her short-term memory was gone, but her long-term memory still worked. But then she had moments where she didn't recognize her family, but she still recognized the pencil. She knew that this was two. She knew the grass was green and the sky was blue, but she couldn't identify the food she was eating. So as she came into the hospital, Dr. Alzheimer ordered more food, more exercise, and a daily bath and massage spa. Any of y'all get one of those ordered? We should all go to Germany, right? And in spite of everything they did, she continued to decline. This is the only known picture taken of Augusta Dieter. Can you guess her age? What does she look like? Most people think she's in her 80s in her, or her 90s. She's 56 years old in this picture. The younger a person is with dementia, the more aggressive the dementia is. The older the person is, the slower the dementia is. When Augusta Dieter died, Dr. Alzheimer was called back to do her autopsy. And when he did her autopsy, he found four things. He wrote a paper about it. He presented it at a medical conference and it became what is uh, put in, it was then put into a medical textbook called Alzheimer's disease. He, her brain had shrunk dramatically in size. Instead of a three pound brain, her brain weighed one pound. Her brain cavity was full of cerebral spinal fluid. Her brain had tangles in it where the neurons had tangled and it had plaque in it. When we talk about plaque in the brain, we're talking about bone tissue, 
not pulpy plaque like what might be in your blood vessels. He wrote the paper, the paper was entitled in a, uh, put in a book, and that's where the word or the name Alzheimer's dementia comes from, is from Dr. Alzheimer's, okay? Yeah. Now, again, these are your nine most common dementias, and these are in your itty bitty dementia book, right, Kathy? Kathy says yes, okay, good. Now the brain runs the body. And I'm sorry, I've got to add one more thing to this slide. The brain tissue is either dying because starving neurons, uh, tau protein begins to fold incorrectly in the roots of the neurons, the dendrites, or what the roots are. And it begins to fold incorrectly. You remember your grandpa had a wooden ruler that folded out, folded out, folded out, and you had a big long ruler? Yeah. Tau protein in the roots of the neuron should fold out to hold the dendrite straight and steady so it can handle an electrical charge and a chemical. But for reasons we don't understand, tau protein begins to fold. That means that the cell cannot take in nutrition, the cell starves, it dies, and it's removed from the body and waste. Other cells are dying because of vascular events, things that are going on that are causing death to groups of cells. And the third way the brain is dying is from alcohol. Alcohol's technical name is neurotoxin. You know what neurotoxin means? Brain poison. Y'all want to go get a margarita after this? Because I'm going to be dry and parched. Okay. Now, you've got to understand we do have abuse that happens. And, and a lot of times it's unintentional. It's a family member being short-tempered with someone because you're exhausted and because you don't understand. It's brain damage. Nobody told you that dementia means their brain is dying. It tells you that they're not doing anything on purpose, no matter how purposeful it looks. It's not on purpose. Purpose takes a three pound brain. You didn't understand that there were stages to the disease or how the disease would progress. Nobody gave you that information. You didn't understand that they didn't understand. They don't understand because we're talking too fast. The normal rate of speed to talk to a person in stage five of dementia is that you have to slow down. And then when you ask a question, you give them up to 15 seconds to respond. And if they don't respond, you repeat the information and count to 15 seconds again. And that's not normal for us. That's not how humans talk, especially our culture. As soon as I finish talking, you start talking. As soon as you finish talking, I start talking. I may even start talking over you. I'm so excited about what we're talking about. The people with dementia have brain damage. So you will get better results with your loved one immediately today if you simply slow down your rate of speed. Understand in stage five, at the beginning of stage five, they understand three out of four words. That's not too bad, right? Three out of four. What if that fourth word was duck? That'd be different, right? By the end of stage five, they're understanding two out of 10 words, but they're listening to your tone and your pitch of voice. So you've got to slow things down to give a damaged brain a chance to understand what it is that you're talking about. You may feel that you've been insulted. We have family members that feel like they've been rejected by their loved one because their loved one's not calling them by the right name anymore. They're not calling you by the right name because your file is being erased as the cells die. They don't remember who you are. It's not on purpose. They assign you someone else in the family because that's who you look like because that file still exists. You may feel alone. How many of you feel alone? That's a normal thing. People at the bill, at the, at the, at the back, at the table, are raising their hand, okay? And then a lot of families believe the person just needs to try harder. And all of that happens because no one explained to them their brain is dying. They're doing the best they can. We don't force your loved one to get up and walk when they can no longer walk because they no longer have the brain tissue that tells the body how to move. Why would we wanna do that to somebody? Does that make sense to everybody? And if you've been doing those things, it's a normal human thing to teach, especially if you have siblings, you have taught. If you have children, you have taught. Don't say it this way, say it this way. Don't do it like this, do it like this. If you are doing that, it's a natural thing because their brain is growing. 
You have to train yourself to stop doing it with your loved one because their brain is dying. And you have to teach your family the same thing. Does that make sense? That can mean that we may no longer call your loved one grandma because she doesn't know grandma. She's now a 30 year old woman who doesn't have kids. Why do people keep calling her grandma? You may have seen your loved one go into a bathroom and come back out and tell you they can't go in that bathroom. There's an old person in there. They see them in the mirror and they don't want to bother them. Or they may get really annoyed with that old person in the bathroom in the mirror because they're not nice. They don't talk back to them. Okay. And those are normal things that happen in dementia care. In dementia, falls are expected. Falls happen because the premotor cortex is destroyed. The motor cortex is destroyed, the, limbia, the limbic system is destroyed, and basal ganglia are attacked and destroyed. And without those systems, you and I can't sit up straight in a chair, we can't hold our head erect above our shoulders, we can't not stand, move, and walk. If your loved one is not doing anything on purpose, they're responding to brain damage. Everybody with dementia falls. It is not a sign of poor care, it's not a sign of somebody in a building not paying attention. Everybody with dementia falls because of brain damage. Now, Alzheimer's people in the beginning fall back into the chair. So we don't even notice their fall because they tried to get up, they couldn't get up, they went back in the chair, they're in the chair, they're fine. We don't even notice it. But eventually they will begin to fall the way vascular people do. People with vascular dementia go to stand, their blood pressure doesn't acclimate quickly enough and they fall forward out of the chair, landing on their faces, their elbows and their knees. How many of you have seen that bruise? That's a gruesome and awful bruise, right? People with Lewy body and Parkinson's fall very uniquely. They suddenly stiffen and fall like a plank. They don't crumple to the ground, they fall forward landing on their face or they fall backwards landing on the back of their head. And this isn't actually related to damage in the motor cortex. It's related to a sudden unconsciousness that we don't understand yet, but we know it's related to the basal ganglia area which is in this part, which is where Parkinson's and Lewy body is. Everybody with me? Okay. People with frontal temporal dementia, there are three categories of FTD. There's behavioral, sexual, communication, and movement. The movement people, the people with movement disorders very quickly are in wheelchairs. So we don't see a whole lot of falls with them. But the other people by the end of stage five are beginning to be bent at the waist as they walk. Now, your brain weighs three pounds. What do you think your head weighs? 20 to 25, depending on how big you are. You have very thick, heavy bone here. As the head goes out of balance, the shoulders follow, and now this person is very out of balance. People with FTD may have up to 30 head strikes a day as they fall. And no, they do not keep helmets on, and they don't remember to stay seated. Everybody with me? Okay. Uh, where to keep Corsicoff, it depends on how long this person abused alcohol, but they are going to fall as well. Huntington's dementia, one of the categories of Huntington's, one of the domains is chorea with a C. Chorea means jerking limbs. So this is a tremor, right? Everybody sees a tremor? This is a chorea, and it's all the limbs jerking. So these people fall in any direction. In chronic traumatic encephalopathy or football dementia, we simply don't have enough information yet, but we know that they fall. One of the domains is movement. Okay, so everybody with dementia falls. It has nothing to do with care. It is part of the disease. Does that make sense? Okay. As long as we're talking about falling, let's talk about what happens in stage six. For some of you, stage six is where your loved one will fracture their hip. And that fracture is a spiral fracture and it doesn't occur because they hit the ground. It occurs because they stood. So they stand at their bed and turn and develop a twist turn fracture, a spiral fracture. They stand from the toilet and turn and break their hip. They stand from the dining room table and turn and fracture their hip. And because of damage in the parietal lobe, they may walk around on that hip for a few hours or a few days before it breaks enough to cause the fall. When your loved one is in stage six and breaks their hip, it means that the brain is now too damaged to monitor the skeletal structure, and it means the end of life is coming. It does not mean someone did poor care. Does that make sense to everybody? And the CAT scan, the x-rays will show that it's a spiral fracture, okay? 
I depressed everyone, didn't it? Y'all got really, really quiet. <laughs> now, the next thing is going to be UTIs. People with dementia develop urinary tract infections. And what you need to do as the caregiver, because even when your loved one's in a community, you're still considered their primary caregiver. It's just you're not supposed to do any of the lifting anymore. What you're going to do is if your loved one has had three UTIs, then you're going to ask the doctor to do a CNS test, a culture and sensitivity test, to make sure the antibiotic that they're using is still functioning. And as the disease progresses, your loved one's UTIs are going to come faster and faster and faster to where at the end of the disease, your loved one will be uh, treated for a UTI, cleared for two days, and back on medication for the next UTI. Now the staff and communities are trained to watch for UTIs. And the reason is a UTI will not kill you or me, but it will certainly kill a person with dementia because it overwhelms their body with infection. And because of brain damage, their body can't fight infection. Now, at some point, your loved one's gonna to go to an ER room with a UTI and either a nurse or a doctor is gonna say, you know, if the community didn't have them in those wet diapers, they wouldn't get a UTI. Well, first of all, we're not allowed to say the word diaper. Diaper is something the child uses. Your loved one uses an adult incontinence product. But this is the, from the grand round of 1984 when we did use the word diaper. And this is a nurse's mnemonic. Are there any nurses in here? Yeah, you guys can't spell. So what a mnemonic is, I have a, a social work degree. So social workers and nurses usually butt heads in communities. And the reason is we know just enough about medicine to drive the nurses crazy. We think that's what the reason is. So a mnemonic is when we use a phrase or a word to help us look for, to remember all the features. So what this mnemonic says is that UTIs cause delirium and delirium causes UTIs. Urinary tract infections are a symptom of dementia, especially late stage dementia. Women have a greater risk for UTIs as we age anyway because of thinning vaginal walls. We lose fluid naturally that way. We give people heart medication that makes them lose fluid. We give people um, medication for depression or we forget to give them medication for depression and people with dementia can get so depressed that even though I put the drink right there, you don't have the strength to take it, lift it and drink it. And if you drink it, then you have to ask for help to go to the bathroom. And guess which group of people don't ask for help to go anywhere? Americans. <laughs> Americans don't ask for help. We're the Americans. We come and save you. You don't help us. Help is not part of our culture. And we're Texans. I'm a ninth generation Texan. We're not allowed to say the word help. It make us a bad Texan. Might make us like somebody from Oklahoma or Arkansas. <laughs> Anybody here from Oklahoma or Arkansas? Yes, ma'am. I'm so delighted to meet you. What, what, where are you from? Well, I was born in Texarkana. On which side? My mom was in Texas. My dad was from Arkansas. And, oh, no. My dad was in Texas. My mom was from Arkansas. And, so they had to go across the state line, and I had to be born in Arkansas. I'm so sorry. We're going to pray for her later. Okay. <laughs> it's very sad. We're going to pray for her. The next thing is we give people medications that make them pee. We give them diuretics. And yes, sir. CNS, culture and sensitivity. Culture and sensitivity. Um, we give people medications that make them pee. And even dementia people figure out that nurse has given me something that makes me pee 30 times a day and I'm not gonna ask for help so I'll stop drinking fluid. So that can happen. And then people with restricted mobility. And if you can't do this, that's restricted mobility. If you can't freely move, you have restricted mobility. And then people with histories of constipation or stool impaction, all of these people, these are the risk of why people get UTIs and dementia. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Next. Now, how many of you feel guilty? Oh, come on, seriously. How many of you feel guilty? You just came today for the fun of it? How many of you feel guilty for being here? How many of you feel guilty for even thinking about memory care for your loved one? You realize it's a medical disease that requires medical care and it's just something you haven't been taught. They have brain damage. They need to go to a place that specializes in brain damage, okay? Do you realize the guilt is endangering you? Three out of 10 of you are in danger. 
of death before your time. And I don't believe for a moment that any of you are married to someone who would say, yeah, you die first. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> the other thing is if something happens to you, who steps up to the table? And some of you are siblings and you've stepped up to the table. And do you know what you've done? You've taught your children that if something terrible happens to me, you still take care of me. Your siblings that you haven't seen in years, they're teaching their children a valuable lesson too. So God will get them. You don't need to worry about it, okay? God will take care of it. Next. So before COVID, our numbers were two out of 10. We knew that two out of 10 family caregivers died first. And now we think it's three out of 10 because you have been clustered and locked down for now we're starting our third year of, of this. And we know that that takes a great toll on you. So are we good on time? Sharon? Okay, okay. lobes of the brain. Now these are the lobes of the brain and each of these lobes does certain things. So when your loved one's behavior changes, it tells us the disease is now in that lobe because only that lobe does those things. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody with me? Because this is the essay part of the test. Okay, I, I know, so pay attention. Next. The little thing in the middle is hippocampus. And hippocampus is hippocampus because, uh, can you click? <coughs> hippocampus is the little green thing there in the middle of the brain. And for you and I to make any memory, this must be functioning. And in people with dementia, a lot of times you might not have even noticed something was wrong with your loved one until the disease reached the hippocampus because they begin to act differently. They begin to ask questions over and over again. They begin to drive you crazy. Now, hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. Can you see the seahorse? It helps if you turn your head sideways. Okay, that's not true. I just do that to see how many people will turn their head sideways. It really does look like a seahorse. Okay. Can you click again? Now, when the disease enters the hippocampus, you begin to see a very distinctive behavior, okay? Would you tell me, Rachel, that I have a doctor's appointment at three? You have a doctor's appointment at three. Now, I made eye contact and I shook my head. What did that mean? I got it, right? But a few minutes later, I say, when is my doctor's appointment? You have a doctor's you hear the tone in her voice? <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Most of the time on the second one, you go, it's at three. And what happens the third time I ask Rachel, when's my doctor's appointment? She does what humans all over the world do. We give you two shots at information and on the third one, we're annoyed. So the third time you ask me, when is my doctor's appointment? I say, I already told you. I have dementia. I don't understand why she's mad at me. So I want to know why she's mad at me. And she says, well, I've already told you. And I said, no, you didn't. Yes, you did. No, you didn't. Yes, you did. Now I'm mad. So I leave and I go somewhere else in the room, somewhere else in the house. A few minutes later, I come back through. I see Rachel. Oh my God, it's Rachel. I'm so excited to see her. Do you know why? She knows the answer. When's my doctor's appointment? And it starts all over again. And in here, it's funny. But how many thousands of times have you been asked? When is the doctor's appointment? Why haven't you fed me? Why didn't I go to the party? How come my son doesn't visit? And the party was here, I was in it, and my son just left. But because of brain damage, I can't put all those things together anymore. Those pieces of my brain don't exist. And when your loved one begins to ask repetitive questions, when they call you 20 times at work and your mom would have never called you at work because it's work, don't bother you at work, excuse me. And now you're getting constant calls when you're getting constant questions, when they don't remember that there's a new grandbaby coming, when they don't remember the doctor's appointment, it indicates to you that this part of the brain has now been damaged. And eventually this part of the brain won't exist. It will be removed cell by cell until there's simply a space there in the brain, okay? Nothing they're doing is on purpose. Next. This is called amnesia. This is true amnesia. The inability to use and retain short-term and eventually long-term memory will also be lost. Next is the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are what make you, you, and me, me. This is my family, my education. 
This is speech, rational thought, judgment, impulse control. Impulse control is what stops you from saying every little mean and nasty thing you thought to them. <laughs> but if you really want to know, does this dress make me look fat? Put it on and go to Arden Courts and they'll take you to the back and the ladies will tell you, yes, it does. <laughs> if you want to know if your haircut is stylish, go ask the ladies in the dementia community and they'll tell you, your hair looks awful. <laughs> if you've got a brand new baby and I'm telling you, don't do this because this one's going to hurt. Take that brand new baby back there and those ladies will tell you, oh, that's an ugly baby. A CNA I knew in Houston had gone to have her baby. And she came back six weeks later to show her residents her baby. And when she brought the baby in, the woman said one thing to her. And in that one thing, you saw damage in the frontal lobes, but still a little bit of mama left in the temporal lobe. She brought her baby in and the woman went, oh my God, that's an ugly baby. Nice shoes though. <laughs> Didn't mama tell you to say something nice? Okay. You've seen this behavior before. How many of you are parents and you'll admit it in public? Wow, two people raised their hand. Hey, you took a three-year-old or a four-year-old somewhere, do you remember? And they saw a person didn't look like anybody they'd ever seen before. Your four-year-old did not come up to you and go, mother, mother dearest, cast thine eye yonder on said peculiar fellow. Can you tell me, thy young child, why is that fellow so odd? Your child didn't do that. Your child went, Mama, how come that guy so? And you couldn't get your hand across her mouth fast enough. Whether it was a shopping cart, a dining table, or down the hall. Your children did that because their brain is growing. Your loved one's doing it now because their frontal lobe is dying. And what it really means to you is not, I need to teach them something because they're rude. What it means to you is there's damage in their frontal lobe. If they think it, they say it. That's why it takes special people to do dementia care professionally because you get your feelings hurt. I've had my feelings hurt. And you have to let it go because it's brain damage. Does that make sense? Okay, next slide. The temporal lobes are these. This is hearing, language, smell, speech. Facial recognition is also here. The left side is formal language. Formal language is what you and I are doing today. Formal language is how we speak to our families, to our colleagues, to people at church. We definitely use formal language. This side is singing, cussing, forbidden words, hateful words. Which one dies first? Formal language, singing and cussing. Formal language dies first. And so suddenly your loved one who never missed a day at church, who may have been a pastor or a deacon, taught Bible school, I can't tell you how many people have told me their mother didn't even know curse words and now she's cursing. <laughs> Ladies, do we all know the curse words? Fellas, do we know the curse words? We all know the curse words. It's just that our upbringing said you don't use those curse words. Now, on a side note, I'm very interested at what's gonna happen when the current group of 20 year olds reach this age because have you listened to any of their music? My grandmother would wash their mouths out with soap. Actually, she'd wash them out with an R. She'd wash out their mouth. So forbidden words are hateful words, ugly words. You're fat, you're ugly, you look stupid. Okay, those are the ugly words that are over here and also curse words. And when the brain can no longer find language here, it will go over here. And so for family members, it's very confusing. You suddenly heard your loved one curse, then they heard church going on and they can sing all the words to Amazing Grace. And you think they're doing it on purpose. And what it really indicates to you is the left temporal lobe has now died and they're using this side to try to communicate. So when you keep bothering me to come take a bath, I'm eventually gonna start pulling words out of here to tell you to leave me alone, okay? Now here's the thing I want you to get from that. That does not mean God has forsaken your loved one. That cursing does not mean your loved one's going to hell. It simply means the disease has progressed, okay? There is not a judgment in here. And that's what I want you to leave with. They're not doing something that means they're gonna to go to hell. They're simply responding to the area of the brain that's damaged. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, next. You better be glad that lady said yes. He's still there. <laughs> Aphasia is the inability to use and understand language. And eventually they do not understand what we are saying to them, but 90% of our communication is done without language. 
It is the pitch and tone of your voice. It is the emotion on your face. So if your loved one is hard of hearing, it's very important that when you get up in their face, that you're keeping a distance because to get closer means you may be trying to have a confrontation with me. And if I don't keep my face at a neutral look, if I change my facial features because I'm now screaming at her because she's hard of hearing, then I can make her think I'm trying to attack her. And if she's naturally a fighter, what's she going to do? Yeah. And when she hits me, who gets in trouble? Me or her? Her. I don't get in trouble. I'm a good caregiver. She gets in trouble. Obviously, she's combative. And what really happened is me. I did it wrong. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Next. The occipital lobes control what you and I are seeing. These have nothing to do with vision. These simply make a muscle in my eye constrict so that you're in focus when you come to my occipital lobe. My occipital lobe is what tells me what I'm seeing. Does that make sense? And now the disease is in the three lobes of the brain that have facial recognition. And so now my mother thinks that I'm no longer her daughter because of brain damage. She doesn't remember having children. Now my mother thinks I must be her mother because I match that file. Does that make sense? It's not because of something she's doing on purpose. She's not trying to insult me. It's that she no longer has the files on me as the person I am. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, next. When the disease reaches the frontal lobes and the occipital lobes, this is called agnosia, the inability to use and recognize common objects or people. Common objects are you need something signed in a pen and they insist a pencil will work. Common objects are you send someone to brush their teeth. How many tubes are in your bathroom that look like they could be toothpaste? What if they use the hemorrhoid cream instead? Well, their teeth might not be clean, but they're a little bit covered up. I looked in my bathroom drawer the other day just to count. I have seven white tubes in my bathroom and only one of them is toothpaste. That's agnosia, the inability to use and recognize common objects. And the people aren't me. Your loved one is never going to know my name. They've already got too much brain damage. The people that they don't recognize are you. They don't remember being married to you. They don't remember that you're their child, not because they don't like you, but because of brain damage. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, next. The parietal lobes are pain, touch, taste, and temperature. These are responsible for raising your body temperature so you can fight infection. These lobes are responsible for sending out white blood cells and T cells to fight infection and Alzheimer's is considered a parietal lobe dementia because so much damage occurs. One of the reasons your loved one gets delirium, one of the reasons your loved one gets urinary tract infections is damage to this lobe because this lobe can no longer tell the body what to do. Does that make sense? People with dementia may or may not feel pain, but the way they express pain tells us they're in pain. And how many of you right now hurt? The rest of you are vivid. <laughs> How many of you are in your 70s? You're in your eighth decade of life. You got to have some aches and pains. If you're in your 90s, you're in your 10th decade of life. Okay? That sounds much different than being in your 90s, doesn't it? When I turned 60, I thought, oh my God, I'm in my seventh decade. <laughs> it took an effect on me. Okay? As the disease progresses, your loved one's way that they express pain is much different. So if a community calls me and says, this person suddenly struck and hit a caregiver who sat down next to them, that's untreated chronic pain. And one of the things you'll find in dementia communities from the doctor is they give pain medication and it says PRN afterwards. What does PRN mean? It means that I've got brain tissue, a full brain, so that I know I'm hurting now, I need to go find a nurse, and I need to ask for my medicine. Your loved ones have brain damage. Why in the world would they have PRN medication? They should be on routine, daily pain medication. 50% of the behaviors in people with dementia are untreated chronic pain. I have been hurting for two weeks waiting for this ice storm that came this week. How many of you can tell the weather? And who's better at the weather, Shauna? A group of people with dementia or the weatherman? 
group of people with dementia because as weather changes, it begins to make fluid, um, it, it begins to affect our joints and they begin to swell and that's where that behavior comes from. Everybody with me? Okay. Touch remains until the end of life. That's why there's so much tactile stimulation done and activity. Body temperature begins to drop. And one of the things you have to monitor is your loved one's body temperature. The normal temperature after stage five is 97 degrees to 95 degrees. Now, 95 degrees is typically a bed-bound person very close to death because death occurs at 93 degrees, okay? But your loved one's body temperature is changing. They really are colder than you and I are. That's why it's not at all unusual to see a person with dementia dressed in August as though they're about to go out in a snowstorm. They really are colder. So as they progress in the disease, we change their clothing. We begin to move to sweats, to thermal underwear, to things to keep their body warm because this lobe is damaged. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, and then you've got to be aware of what their body temperature is. The communities do body temperatures on the day of the month that they do body weights. They take the temperature because if they don't, when this person gets sick, how are we going to know how sick they are? if we don't know what their normal true temperature is at this stage of the disease. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, that's not on the test later, but it's important for you to know. <laughs> this is called apraxia. By the time the disease reaches here, that area right in front of the peak area, that's the motor cortex and the premotor cortex. And by the time the disease reaches the parietal lobe, there's now trouble with movement because those areas have been destroyed. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now this is the medulla obligata. We're now reaching into the brain stem. So your person. How do you understand our taste? Oh, they can taste, uh, what, what flavor do they taste best? Sweets. So if you go into a community, you may see them pouring syrup on scrambled eggs to make it sweeter. We use fruit juices. We use Texas barbecue sauce, not North Carolina. That stuff's got vinegar in it. They'll beat you to death. Don't use that. But we use sweet things to flavor foods. On the day you serve barbecued chicken, there's nothing left but the bones, okay? So we use sweets to get people to take in food. All right, stage five people, we call all dressed up and ready to go. They don't look sick, even though they've lost half a pound of brain tissue. At the beginning of stage five, they're the equivalent of a 12-year-old in the middle of stage five, an eight-year-old by the end of stage five, a four-year-old. How many of you went to bed last night thinking, I swear to God, I'm taking care of an 80-year-old, four-year-old? That's where your person is, okay? That's what that means. And you notice your person begins to do this. What is this? What's it called? A tremor. What's a tremor make you think your person's got? Parkinson's. If they don't have Parkinson's, this is a Parkinsonian feature. They don't actually have trouble with dopamine. This is happening because the disease has now reached the medulla obligata. Next slide. When your loved one begins to have trouble chewing and swallowing food, it means the disease has reached the brainstem. Everything your loved one is doing is directly related back to what is going on in their brain. It has nothing to do with your care. It has nothing to do with our professional care. It is a brain disease destroying the brain. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, feet flat on the floor, hands in your lap. Let's all take a deep breath in. You're going to breathe in to four, hold for two, and breathe out to the count of six. And I'm going to count for you. We're going to do that three times. Everybody ready? Deep breath in. Two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out. Two, three, four, five, six. Deep breath in. Two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out. Two, three, four, five five, six, deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. When your loved one is in a community, breathe that pattern four times when you get there before you ever get out of the parking lot. Breathe before you go in to visit. When you finish your visit, breathe before you leave, before you get back on the highway. This is the meditative breathing. And by breathing out longer, out than your breath in, you will slow down your respiration. You will help yourself stay calmer. Does 
that make sense to everybody? Okay, next slide, please. I just feel so fancy going next slide. So there's changes in the five senses because of brain damage. The brain runs the body. So vision changes from three-dimensional to one-dimensional. People with dementia, it's common that they're bruised from the shoulder down to the knee because they walk into chairs, they walk into doorknobs, they walk into doors, they walk into doorways, they bump into tables, not on purpose, but because they're beginning to have trouble seeing. They lose peripheral vision. For some of them, there will be left eye blindness that will occur. And then you may see them tap a floor, especially if they have to step into an elevator, they will tap that silver bar. And if the floor is oddly colored, that can make it difficult for them. And also if your loved one's in a hospital, you and I see that shiny floor and we think, wow, this place is clean. Your loved one sees that shiny floor and the floor looks like it's moving or it looks like it's covered in water. You with me? Okay, before we had electronic systems, we used to put three foot black rugs in front of exit doors because people with dementia wouldn't step across that rug because the rug looks like a big hole. Think Bugs Bunny and his acne holes, remember? Okay, there is change in hearing, not because they need hearing aids. And oh, by the way, guess what they're gonna throw away in stage six? They're gonna throw away glasses, dentures, and hearing aids. You put it in my ear, I don't know what that is, but because my mother raised me to be a nice person, I'm gonna wrap it in tissue and tuck it down in the trash can. Okay, so don't go buy new hearing aids. This is no longer a matter of the ear. This is a matter of the brain being able to translate sound. I've stood right in front of a person with dementia and said hello and watched them turn behind them trying to figure out where the sound was coming from. So that is a normal thing. They retain the ability to taste and smell sweet things. We know that peppermint stimulates appetite. So if you're having trouble with your loved one eating, you can try a little taste of peppermint candy. We know that if they smell sweet things cooking, they're more likely to eat more of the next meal. And then touch remains until the end of life, but they do some unusual things. So this, everybody do this. This is called, I can see you, everybody do this. This is called filling. This is a natural human thing to self-soothe, okay? This is rubbing. And again, they're rubbing the palm. This is a self-soothing thing. What you need to be thinking is anxiety. Because if this is now going on all day long, that's anxiety, not just a moment of self-soothing. If this is going on constantly, we need to talk to the doctor about anxiety, okay? Also a tool you need to look up. This is in all caps. It's HAM-A. H, I don't see anybody writing. H-A-M-A. This is Hamilton's anxiety test. And you can Google it in all caps, H-A-M-A. -A. This allows you to measure the anxiety on your loved one, okay? And that may be what you need to take to the doctor with you to get medication, all right? Everybody with me? People with dementia fold. You go into a community and you see them folding a basket of socks. They're not doing the laundry. That's the activity department's basket of socks. Even people with dementia need to be needed. If you come into the building and they're cleaning a table, they're not really the table cleaners, they're just doing an activity, okay? And we know that this motion is soothing. So there's things that we just don't understand, but we recognize that they do, okay? So let's talk about vision, because this is important. So everybody put your hands here, not on me, on you. And please remember, I can see you. Where did your neighbor just go? They're gone. Where'd they go? What do you have to do to see your neighbor? Turn your head. So when I'm looking at your loved one, I'm watching to see who turns their head when they're talking. Now make a periscope. Put your finger, your thumb tips together and your fingertips together and make a periscope. Can you see the food in front of you? Well, it's right there at your table. Whose food can you see? Look at her. They gave her pie. I didn't get pie. She's fat. She didn't need that pie. And all of a sudden, your loved one who had the most perfect social skills in the world, you're embarrassed because they're reaching for someone else's food and you don't need to be embarrassed. It means their visual acuity is changing. And that food is what they see. So it means the community has to figure out where is their visual field so that they can set their food. It's not rudeness, okay? Number one, I crave sweets. I like the sweets, I want the sweets. And number two, I can't see my food, but I can see hers. Does that make sense? 
They're not being rude. I'm looking to see who's reaching for food. You with me? Okay, now make binoculars. Boy, that began to change how you see, didn't it? What do you have to do now to see your person? You have to turn at the waist. So I'm watching your loved one to see who turns their head, who's reaching for other people's food, who is twisting at the waist. And then for some of your loved ones in stage six of the disease, and remember stage six is when we're looking for a broken hip. Stage six is when language weight begins to be lost quickly. Stage six is when they begin to bend and start shuffling. Stage six is when they finally look sick. And stage six is when for reasons we don't understand, the right occipital lobe loses the signal to the left eye. And this is now how your loved one sees. So look around now. World looks a lot different now, doesn't it? So Rachel, our good friend. Rachel, can you turn towards me in your chair? Thank you, ma'am. Cover your left eye and your right eye up like this. Now we move at a fast pace, so watch. It looks like I'm running at you. If she was a fighter, what would she have done? If she hit me, who gets in trouble? She does, because she's obviously combative. Who actually caused the behavior? Who's got the three pound brain? Who can change? Me. So put your eyes up again. The correct way to approach a person with dementia is I'm going to come towards her, but when I get within her circle, her space, and remember in Texas, it's this plus a little more. <laughs> we like our space. Okay. When I get in her space, I'm going to slow down and come down to her eyes because if I don't, tell me what part of me you see. Boobs, bellies, and butts. <laughs> some, some men in communities think they've already died and gone to heaven. They're surrounded by boobs, bellies, and butts. So what I have to do when I approach Rachel, put your eyes up, is as I come towards her, I have to slow down and then come down to her eye. And then I make my touch and I move to the side because this is supportive. To stand right in front of someone is considered combative. This is supportive. So every single time I come to Rachel, I must come down to her eye. Otherwise, boobs, bellies, and butts are telling her she's going to go take a bath, and that doesn't make sense. Okay? If she's a fighter, she's going to push it to me. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody with me? Okay, next. Movement is different. If your loved one's in a wheelchair, it's one step per second. Okay, and when we teach this in communities, I've actually had professional caregivers start crying because they had no idea when that person with dementia said slow down, that they meant slow down because they can't see things the way you and I are. And in that they're in a wheelchair, all they're seeing around them are bellies. They're not seeing humans. So we have to come down into their island. If we don't do this, we activate fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And there's a magic thing in dementia communities. Once you get one resident upset, what happens? Then you get two. Two become four, four become eight. And the next thing you know, your whole community is upset for at least a day because of the release of adrenaline. Because I did an approach wrong. Does that make sense to everybody? It also means they can't see us behind us. Can you cover your eyes again? So for years, I would come down a hallway and go, hey, Rachel, how are you doing? Tell me when you see me. Now, so all this time I was making people with dementia scared because suddenly someone touched them. And how uncomfortable would that be for you? Does that make sense? So you've got to slow down speech and slow down movement. Remember, it takes them hours to calm down once we release adrenaline, okay? Our whole goal is to keep everybody calm, to get them through their ADLs every day without anybody getting upset. Remember, approach is always slowing down and coming down to her eye level, always. It never changes. And if I get up and go do something for five minutes, I come back and I do the same thing again. Conversation is gonna be where she is. Her reality is my reality. If I tried to convince her what today really is, all I'm gonna do is make her paranoid, make her not wanna be around me. Okay, what if right now everybody in the room told you the year was 2050? How comfortable would that be for you? Yeah, because the last time you remember the year, it was what year? 
Okay, I noticed a lot of you didn't seem to know the year. <laughs> Uh-oh. And that's how it starts. So one of the things I do with people with dementia is I have a pleasant conversation with them. Where are you from? Where were you born? If you're from the city or the country? What did your daddy do? What was your daddy's name? What did your mama do? Is your mama a good cook? And all I'm doing is really building a rapport and seeing how damaged their old memory is. And then I'm going to come up from that and eventually I'm going to say, what year is it? And when they tell me that year, that's where your loved one is. So if my mother thinks the year is 1970, it's 1970 and she's 30 years old and saying to her, no, 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 you're a mima with 19 great grandchildren. All I'm going to do is make her think I'm crazy and she's not going to want to be around me. Their reality is our reality. You with me? Okay, next. Uh, you want to warm up the conversation. Use your social skills, okay? You don't just walk in and start quizzing someone. You build a rapport with them first, okay? Even with your loved one. You can find out great things about your loved one's life if you stay in their reality and you work with the memory that they still have. They're holding up signs in the back saying, go faster, go faster. <laughs> Sundowning is something that some people with dementia do from stage three until they can no longer move. Some people never sundown. Sundown is something that happens in the afternoon. Do you remember sitting in school? Do you remember looking at that clock and thinking they're never gonna let us out today? Do you remember what time the clock said? Two o'clock. Two o'clock tends to be when you and I start looking to wrap this day up and move on to the next one. Some of you work with people that are very, very good at finishing their jobs at two and for the next three hours, they wander around and visit with people. We're not actually working. Have you noticed that person in your office? So in your loved one, part of this is human habit. Since you and I were born, daddy left work and came home in the evening. If mom was a housekeeper, mom stopped doing house stuff and started doing different stuff to get ready for us coming home. It's primitive instinct. Since time began, you and I stopped hunting and went back to our cave. We stopped farming and went back to our cabin. And in our lifetimes, we leave work and we go somewhere else. As the sun goes down, it means we're fixing to start moving. And the other thing, I'm sorry, that's misspelled, circadian rhythm. Now, do you understand each cell in your body holds your DNA? And we could, in theory, take your cell and grow a new you. Barbara Streisand did it with a dog. Surely we can do it with a human. You understand that? Each cell in your body also contains your day and night rhythm. And in you and I, all of our cells' rhythms are working in the same clock. We wake up in the morning, we go to bed at nighttime. But in your loved one, because of brain damage, theirs begins to go haywire. And that's why some of your loved ones can stay up all night long. That's where the term 36 hour day comes from is stage six people can stay awake and in movement for 36 to 72 hours. You and I can't do that. You and I have to have sleep every 14 hours or we can't function. So some of your loved ones will sundown. Some of them are easily redirected. Food is a wonderful redirector. And there's typically three reasons they need to leave. Reason number one is I need to go get my kids. Who is that person? Male or female? I need to leave and go get my kids. Female. You think it's easy to redirect the moms? No. Some of them are so polite, we can take them away from the door and the whole time they are mumbling under their breath at us, but they're too polite to get angry. Some of them are fighters. How many of you, if you had to go get children right now, would fight us when Sharon locks the door and doesn't let you leave? So some of you are fighters. I got to go to work. That's why I need to leave. Who is that person, male or female? Yeah. Usually a man. Men have been socialized their whole life that you will be the one working and making money. So that's usually pretty easily redirected. The, the highway, the, the bridge fell down. There's been a flood. The hot water heater broke. It's a federal holiday. You were in the military. You don't have to go to work today. It's a holiday. We can usually redirect that. And the last person needs to go home. Is that a stage five person or a stage six person? It's a stage six person because who wants to go home? Somebody between the ages of two and eight. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, next. 
Now, these are two gentlemen. They were both 72 when they died. They had the same college degree. They actually worked in the same fields. One age normally, one did not. This is why we don't quiz people with dementia. This is why they don't follow our instructions. This is why they slap or yell at us or say, that dress makes you look fat, okay? This is why they can't communicate. Every single thing your loved one is doing is directly related back to the area of the brain that's damaged. 